1949, notable French social theorist Simone de Beauvoir said, one is not born a woman, but becomes one. And I opened with this quote because I think that it suggests something very important. It suggests that being a woman is not reducible to biology alone, that there is something more to being a woman than simply being born with female genitalia. And it is this something more, this femininity, if you will, that is the focus of my analysis today. Particularly, my research sheds light upon the ways in which the expressive art of femininity is negotiated within the Audubon community of Chennai, which is one of South India's most visible and thriving male-to-female transgender communities. So generally speaking, Aravanis are biological males who unequivocally believe that they're women, believe that their transgender identity is a divine blessing from Shiva that imbues them with the power to confer fertility and good fortune upon others, adopt the dress of Indian women, and typically undergo a surgical procedure to remove their male genitalia. Now these sartorial and physical markers of identity are embedded within a much larger process of gender identity construction, wherein Aravanis discipline their bodies, uh, their bodies, behaviors, and psychologies in accordance with localized norms of femininity, and it is this larger process which I will be talking about today. So my research was guided by three central questions. First, what are the articulations of femininity which exist within the Audubonic community? Specifically, is there one monolithic ideal of femi uh, femini femininity excuse me, to which this community aspires, or do interpretations of the feminine ideal vary from individual to individual? Second, which physical behaviors and processes of beautification do Audubonis deploy in order to embody their understandings of ideal femininity? And three, which criteria do Audubonis use to gauge the relative authenticity of their gender performances? So to provide a little bit of context, historically transgender communities have occupied a largely invisible space at the fringes of the Indian consciousness, but the past two decades have witnessed an increase in their popularity as a topic of study in gender scholarship, in the Indian cultural context speaking very broadly, uh, which is characterized by sexual conservatism, an overtly patriarchal social structure, and an intolerance for alternative sexuality, transgender communities occupy a liminal space between the sacred and the profane. On the one hand, they are revered as holy figures because they have the power to bestow blessings upon others, but on the other hand, they live their lives as social pariahs because of widespread transphobia. In India, the perceived ambiguity of individuals' gender identities, that is neither fully male nor female, is ultimately preclusive of their full participation in society. And as a result, many transgenders uh, turn to begging sex work or offering blessings in exchange for money in urban areas as a means of supporting themselves. One of these communities, the Hijras, are the most frequently encountered figures in ethnographies of India's transgender uh, population and have come to represent this population more generally, more generally in the global imaginary. However, while Hijras are very similar to Aravanis in that they also believe that they're women and believe that they have divine power, they differ in a number of regards, specifically in regard to their gender identity construction. Whereas Hijras locate themselves within a binary frame of gender reference, uh, the Aravanis do not locate themselves in this imagined interstice between man and woman, but instead uh, believe that they are fully woman. I'll return to this later in my findings section, but I wanted to raise uh, your attention to this because it, um, because it suggests that my research is necessary. Aravanis are curiously ignoring existing scholarship on transgender communities in India. In order to develop any comprehensive understanding of transgender identity, we need to ex expand the scope of literature such that it recognizes the diversity of voices which emerge from these communities. So I connected my research in the southern city of Chennai, a city of roughly 4.3 million people with the largest Aravani community in the state of Tamil Nadu. In order to develop rapport with the insular Aravani community, I worked with the Social Welfare Association for Men, which serves as a drop-in center to provide uh, sexual health counseling, HIV AIDS counseling, and it's a community-based organization. And due to the efforts of organizations like SWAM, Tamil Nadu has become one of the most progressive states in the movement for transgender equality in India. Uh, this increasing tolerance for alternative sexuality has encouraged steady growth of a thriving and intricately structured MSM, or Men Who Have Sex With Men, community in Chennai, which has within it a multiplicity of sexual identities which are along a spectrum. And within the MSM consciousness, these sexual identities are distinguishable from one another based on the relative degree of masculinity or femininity that each invokes. Now, Aravanis occupy the extreme effeminate end of the spectrum and are said to be 100% feminine in their psychologies, behaviors, and physicality. So I'm going to take a moment to introduce my case study profiles. Uh, my first is Priya Babu. She is 40 years old. She's one of the most prolific social activists uh, in the community in India. She's also a documentary filmmaker. She's a board member of SWAM. Rima, she's 23 years old. She's in Nirvan uh, Aravani, which means that she has undergone sexual reassignment surgery. And she's employed by SWAM as a community outreach spokesperson. Gomati, who's 31 years old, also operated and a member of SWAM. Lalita, she's 31 years old, and my only unoperated, or Akua uh, Aravani. And Malika is my final one. She's 29 years old, is operated, and is the first trans and is the world's first transgender supermodel. So I found 
A number of findings. First, gender practice, the assignment which I uh, used to refer to the assignment of gender classification to certain repertoires of behavior. Artabani's understand the home as a gender domain and housework as a uniquely feminine practice. And this affinity for housework, such as cooking, cleaning, and putting art on the roadside, emerged in childhood and was one of the earliest avenues through which Artabani's can embrace their femininity. And although this affinity for housework was shared by three of my respondents, Lavi Damalega's responses were very different. Uh, they found employment, um, which they attribute to their high level of education and exposure to an elite community of upper middle class urban women who interrogate the values of tradition and family that village born out of Bonnie's uh, embrace. Uh, the fact remains, however, that the majority of Aravani's glorify domesticity and implicit within this glorification a desire on behalf of all Aravani's to marry a Pompey and me doting wives. Uh, they define being good wives as uh, doing housework, getting hot water for baths, preparing food, washing clothes, sending them to the office with a packed lunch, and furthermore, Aravani's consider the sexual satisfaction of their Pompeys to be of great import, often placing the sexual needs of their husbands before their own, and they adopt the receptive position during sexual intercourse. Audubonians understand this role in sexual intercourse to be an authenticating aspect of their identities as women. And critically for Audubonians, the purpose of sexual intercourse is not to fulfill their own sexual desires, but to prove to their husbands that they can provide the same sexual pleasures afforded by the physicality of the biological female. Uh, another aspect of, uh, of this is sartorial desire, whereas Priya Babu, who is, who is uh, 40 years old, says that she enjoys wearing saris because it maintains her status in the community, um, Gomati, for instance, who's much younger, likes to wear salwar kameez because it's more age appropriate for her, which suggests that there's a difference in the way that they conceptualize their identity through their clothing. Uh, another aspect is physicality. They favor long hair and said it was the most beautiful quality of a woman. They greet each other in the morning by complimenting uh, each other on their hair. They, um, they desire smooth, fair skin, which they achieve through creams, uh, chimpe, which is a tool used to pluck hair out of the face, and a painful process of electrolysis in order to get that desirable feminine skin. They also uh, prefer a slim, curvy body, which they achieve through hormone therapy, through things like sexual reassignment surgery. In order to create the illusion of childbearing hips, they exaggerate the sway of their walk, which they believe offers, uh, or offers evidence of their internal female temperament. The way that they evaluate their gender performances is uh, their ability to pass as women in larger heteronormative social contexts. So the Ardabonic with whom I spoke said that the way in which that they understand that they have successfully enacted a recognizably feminine gender performance is their ability to pass as women in uh, train cars or in public. However, um, um, Lalita, who is more educated, uh, says that femininity is not, does, not come from external, uh, does not come from external affirmation, but is something internal. Uh, so my conclusions, the finding of my research suggests that rather than subscribing to a single monolithic understanding of what it means to be an Indian woman, multifarious interpretations of femininity exist among the Ardhavanis of Chennai. And Ardhavanis formulate these interpretations by submitting localized norms of femininity to unique subjectivities which develop and are subject to alteration throughout their life courses. Thank you.